Uh, we're studying tonight Jesus, the subject of prophecy. Now, why did God give prophecies of the Messiah? Why, why did he tell some things in advance? You know, from before the beginning, God had a plan to rescue people who were separated from him by sin. Ephesians 3.9 talks about the mystery that had been hidden since before the foundation of the world. God's always had this plan, but it's just been kind of revealed piece by piece by piece. And part of that revelation piece by piece was prophecies that he was giving. So God gave prophecies to someone who was coming from the beginning to about 400 B.C. We don't know the exact date of the beginning, but uh, some sense of the beginning until 400 B.C., God gave more than 100 prophecies in Scripture, some number it higher than that, but certainly uh, uh, as many as 100 we can discern pretty well. Why did he give all these prophecies? Why do we have all those prophecies in Scripture about the one who is coming? Well, I would suggest about three reasons why prophecies came from the beginning to about 400 B.C. First, he will unfold the mystery. In the New Testament, as we look back, it says several times that Christ was the culmination of that mystery. And so God used these prophecies to help show the, put the pieces together so that when it was fulfilled over here, then you could look back and see how the pieces fit together. So that was one reason that he uh, gave those. Another is to set an expectation. Um, God wanted people to be uh, in anticipation of something that was about to happen. And so people in the Old Testament, Hebrews 11 says that people in the Old Testament longed to look forward to those things and, and they didn't get to see them all yet. They didn't see, hadn't, didn't see how it all unfolded. And several other passages talk about that as well. But he created this sense of expectation. And that was important to try to help keep people on path. And then it, it will allow authentication. After the fact, you can look back and say, well, look. Look at all that was said beforehand. And here, if it all comes true, then we will see that, that God's will has been authenticated. So those are some of the reasons why we have these prophecies. Now, tonight we, of course, won't have time to look at all 100 of these unless you want to take, you know, is midnight okay? Probably not. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, we'll look at some of these prophecies, some of the key prophecies that paint the picture of one who is coming. And of course, you know, as, as the prophecy is mentioned, you'll know how it was fulfilled, but we're just going to look at them, first of all, from the standpoint of the prophecy as it's made. Well, the first one of those would be Genesis 3.15, where God is talking to Adam and Eve, who just sinned, been misled by Satan. And so uh, God says that, that Satan will bite the heel of one of Eve's offspring, but that offspring shall bruise the head of the serpent. This one who is coming, first prophecy about the one who's coming, says he's going to be a person of power, powerful, who will be able to stomp on the head of the serpent and deal thus the death blow to, uh, to the serpent. There, of course, representing Satan. Now, Genesis 12, 3 would be the next prophecy. As God calls Abraham uh, to go into a land that he will show him, God tells Abraham that he will have a land and he'll have be the, the father of a nation and that one of his seed uh, through Isaac shall bless all who would ever live doesn't mention Isaac in that passage, but it would be through Isaac that that's fulfilled. That somehow the seed of Abraham is going to bless the whole world. 
That was given about 1900 B.C. So you, you see that these are beginning to have some time slot we can put them in. 2,000 years before Jesus comes, this prophecy would be. And so through Abraham and later through Isaac and Jacob, God is going to bless everybody who would ever live. Something's coming that's going to be wonderful. And so we learn that this one who is coming will be of the line, the lineage of Abraham. Well, the next one we want to take note of is in Deuteronomy 18.15, where Moses is writing in Deuteronomy, giving this speech that he gives to the Israelites shortly before he's going to die, about 1450 B.C., and he says that someday God is going to raise up one like him, going to raise up one like Moses. And to him, you want to listen. God's going to raise up one like Moses. Well, Moses was a lawgiver and a prophet. So this one coming is going to be powerful. This one coming is going to be of the lineage of Abraham. This one who is coming is going to be a lawgiver and a prophet. We're going to get a little bit of a picture now of the one who is coming. Uh, and this passage in Deuteronomy helps us to have that. Then in 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 16, God tells David that he's going to establish through him a line of kings that will last forever. And so David's uh, seed are going to remain on the throne of Israel. And they did for a long time, for several hundred years. But eventually that kingdom was destroyed. But still there is a king that's coming. And for that prophecy to be fulfilled, there has to be one that will eventually come and, and in that coming will fulfill the prophecy given to David about 1010 B.C. Now, we come down to some more details about this uh, one who is coming. Uh, Isaiah 7, 14, that uh, this, this one shall be born of a virgin. That's an interesting passage because it's, a, it's one of the fairly few prophecies that have a double fulfillment. This was spoken to Ahaz, the king, and the point to Ahaz was before a woman who doesn't have any children uh, has a child and that child grows up, you're going, your kingdom is going to be overthrown. So that's the meaning back originally. And then um, uh, Matthew says that that has, in uh, Matthew 1, 22 and 23, uh, says that that is going to have an application uh, to Jesus. And so Jesus is going to be the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of that prophecy. And so that uh, one to come will be born of a virgin. Then on Micah 5.2, he'll be born in Bethlehem. Born in Bethlehem. Well, there's, a, there's an interesting detail. That's the, uh, that's the family home of David. And so he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Then in uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, Jeremiah says that there's going to be a new covenant given that's not like the covenant given when Moses was at Mount Sinai. And so there's a new covenant coming. And obviously, that lawgiver that Moses spoke of is the one who's going to give that new covenant. So here's some of the work that he's going to do. He's going to deliver a new covenant. When he comes, several things that he's going to do. Uh, he will heal people, Isaiah 53, 4. He's going to be a miracle worker. When he comes, he'll speak in parables. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. When he comes, he'll have the Spirit upon him. Isaiah 61. Not all 
Sounds like everything is just going to flow very smoothly. But wait. You ever heard that on TV? But wait. There's something else. His people will reject him. Well, now, wait, wait a minute. What, what's going on here? He's going to be powerful. He's going to deliver a new covenant, be a lawgiver, a prophet, a king. Why would you reject someone who is coming to your people who would be so great like that? And yet it says his people will reject him, Isaiah 53. 3 uh, goes on to say, he shall suffer in silence, Isaiah 53, 4 through suffer. Why would, why would this great one that's coming be one who will suffer? His hands and feet will be pierced. Well, what, I, want, I wonder what the people who heard that thought of. His hands and feet will be pierced. I think we know what to think of, but what did they think of? In his death, he will be with the wicked and with the rich. Isaiah 53, 9. Oh, here's a key one. But by his wounds, we are healed. He's going to be wounded. He's going to be pierced. He's going to suffer. He's going to be rejected. Would God send a prophet to be treated that way? Well, some of the Old Testament prophets weren't treated too well, were they? But here's, here's this one that began to be spoken of from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Be rejected, wounded, pierced, suffer. But in that suffering, he will be one who brings some kind of healing to people. Well, we keep on reading. He will be raised from the dead, Isaiah 53, 10, Psalm 16, 10. And finally, he will come during the time of the Roman Empire, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Here, here's a very interesting one because... It tells us that something about the timing of all of this. Nebuchadnezzar's had a dream. You remember in that dream he saw an image, a statue that had a head of gold and chest and arms of silver and belly and thighs of brass and legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. And Daniel indicates that these represent four successive empires. And Nebuchadnezzar represented the head of gold, the Babylonian Empire. The one to follow him would be the Medes and the Persians, the arms and breasts of silver. And then there would come the Greeks under the uh, uh, reign of Alexander the Great. And then the, one, the next great world empire that came was the Romans. And Daniel 2.44 says, in the days of those kings, that must be the Romans because if he came earlier than that, then the fourth kingdom wouldn't have happened. In the days of those kings, God himself shall establish a kingdom that will come along and destroy the image. So this one who is coming, this king that's going to come, is going to come during the days of the Roman Empire. So we've, we've moved along now from the time of the beginning. Woman's seed is going to bruise the head of the serpent. We've seen the characteristics of this one who's coming. We've seen many of the details about his life. And so we've seen what he's going to do. And we've got a good clue as to when he is coming. When he's coming. Now... Let's summarize these prophecies a little bit. He is born in the lineage of David and Abraham. He has to be in that line. And you remember, of course, that both Joseph and Mary were of the line of David. And so that would be the line of Abraham and the line of David. 
He was to be born of a virgin in Bethlehem during the time of the Roman Empire. That's a really interesting one how that was fulfilled. Where did, where did Mary and Joseph live? Did they live in Bethlehem? No, they lived in Nazareth. Uh-oh, the Lord made a mistake. He picked a couple living in Nazareth instead of a couple living in Bethlehem. But wait. Caesar Augustus issued a decree and said that everybody had to go to the hometown and register there for tax purposes. And that meant that Mary and Joseph had to make a trip to Bethlehem when uh, she was soon to have a child. And so, through the workings of the Roman Empire, in which time this is coming, through the workings of the Roman Empire, God got Mary and Joseph, the couple he had chosen, to be in Bethlehem at just the right moment. So Jesus could be born there. And it was announced by, uh, announced by angels who spoke to shepherds. And uh, uh, wise men came and offered uh, expensive gifts to provide the young couple with some funds. And so these prophecies are fulfilled, many of them in a very unusual way. So it'll be a, a virgin born in Bethlehem during the time of the Roman Empire. He will be a lawgiver like Moses and bring a new covenant. Of course, that's what Jesus did. He was there. He is the one who delivered the new covenant. His teachings became the elements in that new covenant that would take effect upon the time of his death. Then we also learn that he will heal and teach in parables. And Jesus did just that, didn't he? He'll be rejected and suffer in silence. And we know how he was given a false trial, and he did not respond in ways that were raised big objections or try to fight against what was happening. He suffered in silence. His hands and feet were pierced by his crucifixion. And in his death, he was with the wicked and the rich. The wicked because he was crucified with two thieves, with the rich because he was buried in a rich man's tomb. He will bring spiritual healing. Uh, and that, of course, was his mission as he worked with his apostles and taught them and helped them to know what they needed to teach. And eventually he was raised from the dead. And uh, had he not been raised from the dead, then uh, he wouldn't be the living Lord that we have today. Well, all of this, of course, sounds like somebody you know. And these and many other prophecies describe exactly Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem of a virgin in the days of the Roman Empire, uh, taught and gave the new covenant, rejected, crucified, raised from the dead. Well, you got to wonder, how, how is this possible? Let's suppose that all of us decided tonight we're going to write some prophecies. And we're going to write them down, we're going to put them in a time capsule, and in 100 years, or 1,000 years, or 2,000 years, would you really expect that those things to come true? We wouldn't have one chance in a million of prophesying of things that far in advance. And yet, they did come true. And so only through the power of God who can predict the future and then work so that it comes to pass. That's the only way that can happen. There's no other power on earth that can do it. You know, we, <laughs> if, you, if you watch the, uh, the newspapers at the checkout desk, it's de checkout stand in the grocery store about December, They'll tell you everything's going to happen in the, in the coming year. And once in a great while, they get one right. 
we're talking about not it'll happen in next year, but 400, 500, 1,000, 2,000 years in advance. And every one of them came true just exactly as God spoke it. So we know that that's only through the power of God that that can happen. And so knowing uh, how Jesus fulfilled these prophecies exactly, every one of them, 800 years in advance, provides a strong basis for believing in him. That's one of the main reasons we can believe in him. And if you read in Acts chapter 2, for example, when Peter uh, is preaching uh, there on, on the day of Pentecost, he quotes one of the prophecies of the Old Testament about David, who said that uh, God wouldn't allow his body to see corruption. And so he, he applies that prophecy to Jesus as one who was raised from the dead. And so the early church made this very point that here are prophecies and Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. Well, here are some conclusions we draw from this. God was developing a plan and made predictions about it. God had this plan, this mystery that he was revealing, opening up piece by piece by piece. He had a family in Abraham. He had a nation in Israel. He had prophets that came to predict the future. Jesus comes and is born and lives and teaches and dies and is resurrected. And all of these prophecies are fulfilled exactly. And so God was developing this plan and made predictions about that plan so people would see it coming piece by piece by piece by piece. Then Jesus' life exactly matched the many prophecies about the coming Messiah. There's not one that was not fulfilled. Isn't it interesting that when, when the wise men came and they, they went to Herod, and wanted to know where is the king to be born. He called the Jews and they told him. And they told him right, didn't they? It's going to be in Bethlehem. And sure enough, that's exactly where it was. They understood these prophecies. And so Jesus' life exactly matched these. And uh, it would have been impossible to set up a life to match all of these. Uh, you couldn't twist enough events and twist enough things to happen to make all that take place. And so you have to see that in this, we have plenty of evidence on which to believe that Jesus is the coming Messiah sent by God. So that's, uh, that's a very important part of this whole picture about prophecy. Now, I would suggest about three verses to close with here. Uh, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. Paul, writing to Timothy in this last book that Paul ever wrote, 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 10, says, So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose. See, there it is, his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. God started way back before the beginning to have a plan, and, and these prophecies were part of revealing that plan. Then turn to John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 44. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 44. And here we see how these prophecies set an expectation. John 1, 44. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, 
and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. They knew what these prophecies were, and here's one that's, that's matching what the prophecies had. So that was part of the expectation. And then, number three, he was allowing authentication. When Peter concludes his sermon in Acts chapter 2, having referred to the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, the miracles he did, and to uh, his resurrection, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. So he's using these to authenticate the fact that Jesus was who he said he was. Well, what shall we do with what we know? Well, I think the, uh, the great truth we want to take from this, the practical application from this is we want to learn to live like Jesus. We want to learn to be the kind of person he was. And uh, in our lectureship at Oklahoma Christian in October, we're going to be emphasizing the importance of learning to follow in his steps, follow in his steps. And we're going to be talking about five ways to follow in his steps. If Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these prophecies, and he is, then we need to accept him and live the way he wants us to live. And so there are five words that we're using to describe how we ought to follow in, uh, to be like Jesus. First is to serve. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. He washed the disciples' feet. He healed people. He did many things to serve people. And if we want to be like Jesus, we need to serve. You're having a health clinic, so you can do what? Serve people. So you want to serve. Then we want to tell. Jesus came and preached. He went around from synagogue to synagogue. He got on the hillside, delivered the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he taught the woman at the well. Every opportunity he could find, Jesus was telling people what they needed to do, how they needed to live. And we need to be tellers of the gospel. Uh, we, need to, we need to share with people. Don't be afraid to tell people where you go to church. How long since you told somebody where you went to church? I had some physical therapy today, and uh, so while the guy was messing around with my shoulder, which I fell on at Christmas time, <laughs> still trying to get to working very well, uh, he, uh, I said, well, uh, you live around here? Yeah, I, I lived over there in a certain housing area, and I knew that was right across the street from Memorial Road Church of Christ. So what am I going to say? Well, did you ever drive by that? Yeah. And so we began to talk about the church a little bit, and I told him, I told him what I told you about looking up when I was going to die. I thought that would probably stick in his mind a little bit. You know, I don't know whether you'll ever come to church there or not, but you plant the seed, and what does God say? Somebody's going to bear fruit. So just, just get out there and talk about it and tell people and find people that you can study with. But even beyond that, just, just sow the seed everywhere you go. Just let people know what's going on at this church and, and how, you can, uh, how, uh, how you come here and how much it means to you. Tell. Third word is exemplify. Our lives need to show what Jesus was like. In humility, loving enemies, all those things that Jesus did to show us how to live. He is our great example. And we follow in his steps when we live the kind of life he showed us how to live. Jesus was a man of prayer, wasn't he? Prayed a lot. Sometimes spent all night praying. Jesus' prayers always interest me a lot because... Jesus is divine himself. Why would divinity have to speak to divinity? Why did Jesus have to pray to God? Well, he wanted to feel close to God. 
The only time Jesus has ever been separated from God and in a real sense was for 33 years while he was on earth. He wanted to sense that closeness. And before major events like choosing the apostles, Jesus prayed. The wonderful prayer he gave in, in uh, John 17 is just amazing. Jesus was a man of prayer. If we want to be like him, we've got to be praying people. And finally, Jesus sacrificed. We know how much he gave up to come to earth in order to give us a chance to live. We need to be people of sacrifice. You read about the early church, and they were people who sacrificed. They, they, would, they would go into the arena to be eaten by lions singing hymns to Jesus. What are we sacrificing? Time, some money. Uh, let's be those who sacrifice for Jesus. Well, that's our lesson tonight. And uh, I hope you'll think about these prophecies that Jesus fulfilled and how that brought him here to be our Savior and how we want to be like he was.